Hi, Brittany. Uh, thank you so much for your participation tonight. Um, I'm so excited about listening about your uh, Indigo journey and all everything. Um, can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, Rosa. Thank you so much for having me. I am Britt Bowles, and I'm really excited to be here and share with you a little bit about my Indigo journey. So I'm located in Gearheart, Oregon. I grow Persicaria tincturia in partnership with North Fork 53 Farm, which is located in the Halem. We're on the unceded lands of the Clatsop and the Halem peoples. And I'm an artisan, I'm a grower, I'm a facilitator. I'm often called an indigo doula. And um, I've been growing now for five seasons. I'm in growing zone 8B. And it's a really temperate climate here. We have a growing season uh, from about April to October. I've just started my seeds on the equinox of March and I'm growing several different varieties of Persicaria tincturia, also known as Japanese indigo. You can see some here in my hands with the blue pigment paste as well. And I also grow other dye plants in the garden. So not just indigo, this is a few of the other plants we have here as well. Marigolds, Weld, Matter, Dyer's Chamomile, Cosmos, Pincushion, Coryopsis, just to name a few. And I typically am growing in rows, but also beds as well, and even sometimes containers. Um, I grow typically anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 indigo plants. Uh, and some of those are sold to the local community. We usually have a dye plant sale here in May. And I typically get about three to four harvests from my indigo each season. I'm processing that indigo a variety of ways. Um, some of those ways are fresh leaf methods, aqueous extraction, and more recently I've been drying my leaves uh, for a new to me experiment. So again, some of those techniques I mentioned, uh, just to dive into them a little bit further, you can see from this diagram, I've included a variety of ways to interact and access the pigment from these fresh green leaves. Some of my favorite ways include the blender, salt, tatakazome, uh, and including the fermenting and drying methods. I will reduce that indigo pigment into a vat and sometimes apply that pigment directly through paints or pastels. And I'm gonna go into these a little bit further as well. So one of my favorite things to do is collaborate with other local artists and other local growers. I was introduced to the plant by Kara Gibbs of Vibrant Valley Farm here in Oregon. Um, she and I started collaborating, teaching classes, um, growing indigo plants, collecting indigo pigment together with Iris Sullivan Dare. Uh, we started the Indigo Fest organization and we put on an annual event each year celebrating local indigo. Uh, we offer virtual courses and products. Another um, dear to my heart um, project is the Indigo Pigment Extraction Methods Group on Facebook which includes the Blue Biography series um, and the Natural Dye podcast with Kelsey Doty. And I love working with other local artisans, figuring out ways that I can offer them pigment and dyes as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about some of these projects. This was Indigo Fest 2019. This was at North Fork 53 Farm, where I grow indigo in the Halem, Oregon. And um, this was a collaboration again with Iris Sullivan and Kara Gibbs. We really worked on creating a local indigo vat with local fiber. So this experience was all about um, 
interacting with the fresh plant, extracting pigment, learning how to vat that pigment, uh, learning about some local fibers and what that would look like uh, for local artisans and how they can incorporate local indigo into their projects. So um, we had a full weekend of workshops um, and it ended uh, in a beautiful kind of celebration of our local indigo. And this process brought me to uh, 2020 where we weren't able to have a physical event during the pandemic and a lot of my work really shifted. Um, my practice shifted into virtual community and virtual offerings. So the Intuitive Indigo course was birthed during the pandemic in the middle of the summer and I really wanted an opportunity to connect with people over indigo practice and what does that look like. So we talk about batting techniques from pigment to dye, setting the vat table, and the difference between homegrown pigment and commercial pigment um, can be quite daunting for artists and growers to go from commercial to their own homegrown pigment if they're growing indigo. So we walk through those um, different subtleties in pigment application and also talk up through the vat tending rituals. A lot of this looks like vat conversations. Uh, it looks like um, a lot of intuitive practice on a small scale uh, to slowly kind of build up a library of reference for um, your vat and how to communicate and tend it long term. Um, being intuitive indigo, I came across some difficulties in my own practice, and some of those difficulties were remedied in partnership with my husband, Andy Bowles. Um, one of those things uh, was the resist shapes that I was using. I was using wooden resist shapes that often get waterlogged and crack and break, um, and they're a little slippery. It's difficult to get a clean resist oftentimes. So Andy and I were able to collaborate uh, and create 3D printed resist shapes to actually clip into the clamp. Um, and they are very much inspired by the Itajime shape resist, which is a shibori technique from Japan. Um, through, through again the process of creating an efficient dye space. My husband and I also went on a journey to redesign the VAT table for the VAT workplace. I really wanted to include the VAT into the table itself um, and create a ergonomic, cohesive, mobile environment. Um, so we've been on a journey to um, kind of redesign that workspace and make it easier and more efficient for folks. So I want to talk through just a few of those techniques that I mentioned earlier. One of my favorite techniques is working raw, straight from the plant. I love crushing up the leaves in my hands. I love that contact. I love the stain on the skin. Um, I love that tactile sensation. And it's easy. It's simple and um, it starts with the seed. So before indigo is planted uh, from the mother pink flower, the seeds ripen. And you can see some of these brown seeds on the far right um, image here of the flower head. And in its natural environment, those flower heads would fall directly onto the dirt. The seeds would ripen as groupings, as clusters of plants. Uh, you know, we're so used to individually planting our seeds one by one, but 
in a natural setting, uh, we would just have these lovely little groupings of plants. Um, and indigo is actually really happy to come up in these little groupings, I found. So this is what we're used to seeing when we buy indigo seeds. We're used to seeing this really beautiful, rich brown seed. It's quite small. Um, it's quite amazing to think of the potential of future blue in this tiny brown seed. Um, but I want to encourage folks that it doesn't need to look this clean or thrashed and winnowed. Uh, you can plant those uh, entire flower heads whole right into the ground. And later on in the season, you're going to have these ripe, um, beautiful green leaves. A lot of people think they look like spinach or small basil or chard leaves. Um, they're edible. Uh, they're quite tart um, and bitter, but it's a wonderful, refreshing snack. Um, sometimes people make this into a tea. They'll dry the leaves and drink it that way. Quite good. And my favorite way, again, is to just directly have contact with the plant. So um, there's a beautiful method of adding salt. Um, again, this is a Japanese method of uh, directly um, applying uh, pressure with your hands to the leaves. So we aren't using any mordants. We aren't using any assists. We just have uh, fresh green leaves, no water necessary, and we add that salt and we start to mash as if it were green leafy dough. And pretty soon that salt breaks down the cell wall and the leaves become uh, just this beautiful teal sea foam grain juice. So we're actually taking the moisture from the leaf itself with the salt and creating a liquid to dye with. Um, sometimes it can take quite a long time to process. This is a really beautiful thing to do with friends, with community. I'm often processing fresh leaves with others uh, whenever possible. The fresh silk gets immersed right in and mashed just like green dough all together with the salty indigo you can see now it's oxidized and it's turned darker darker green and depending on the fiber type and the concentration uh, meaning how many leaves you add to that mash you'll end up with a variety of shades all the way from emerald to seafoam green to blues to teals on um, Silks, wool, and protein blends. Um, it's especially beautiful. You can achieve results on cellulose as well with the assistance of a protein binder like soy. So a few more examples. And I want to talk next about the aqueous pigment extraction method. This is and my favorite way to get indigo pigment to use later in a vat. And you can see here, there's a couple of stages. There's the fresh green leaves immersed, uh, immersed in water on your left-hand side. And then they're fermenting here in the middle. The leaves are starting to denature. Uh, they're releasing the indican precursor and that indican pre precursor becomes indoxyl rich liquid. And this is actually the last stage of pigment settling to the bottom of the jar on the right. So after those leaves have been fermented and they're removed from the jar, it looks like this bright aqua neon mermaid juice, I like to call it. And here you can see actual pigment floating on the top of the surface of the liquid here. Orange Cosmo, um, just for 
for contrast. And in order to convert that indoxal rich liquid to indigo tin, we aerate and I'm using a paint mixer attachment on a drill. And I also include calcium hydroxide lime as a flocculant to speed up the process. You can see that emerald green water turning to that darker, darker blue, and eventually settling and straining out to this rich, thick, dark pigment paste you see here with the fresh green leaf for contrast. There's the pigment settling at the bottom of the jar. And I'm gonna talk about why I like to utilize and save and store my pigment as wet paste. Um, the first season, you can see I have some dried flakes, some um, indigo flakes. Um, this is pigment that's just dried out before it's ground into a fine powder. And the paste on the left is a really beautifully hydrated, ready for your vat um, substance. So I now prefer to store it as wet pigment instead of dried powder. Um, I will dry out my powder if I'm using it to create paints or pastels, but if I'm saving it for my vat, I always store it wet and it's ready to go. I don't have to grind it. I don't have to rehydrate it. It goes into reduction almost instantly. It's just beautiful to look at. Uh, it's also a lot of fun to paint with directly. So there's some more of that dried powder. This is a really great way to um, store long-term and also to send your pigment to others, of course. Sending wet paste is tricky. And once we vat that wet paste or powder, looks like this, there's various stages of fiber coming out of the vat. The yellow one in the middle is oxidizing and turning darker and darker green and then darker and darker blue. This is the magic of indigo breathing and coming right out of the vat. Some more dyed fibers on the line. And I wanna transition now to talking a little bit about how my community has affected me in my indigo practice. So the very first year that I decided to grow indigo, I started a little Facebook group with a couple of friends and I was thinking that would be an intimate place where we would share our journey with processing the indigo that we had just grown. We really didn't know what we were doing, so I immediately started reaching out to other growers um, from other communities, mostly on Facebook, social media, on Instagram. I um, started inviting people to this group, Indigo Pigment Extraction Methods. Uh, this is on Facebook groups, and this particular group is dedicated to plant processes. I wanted to differentiate between um, using commercial pigments and using pigments that people have grown from their own indigo bearing plants. So this is a huge topic. It's very diverse. There are many different types of indigo bearing plants. Uh, it's now grown into a global group with um, all the different kinds of varying indigo plants being shared, people from all over the globe. There's over 6,500 people in this group now. And again, last year during the pandemic, a lot of my processes changed, a lot of my plans changed. And one of the things that came out of that year was the Blue Biography series. So in order to kind of create, <clears throat> create a more intimate connection with people virtually, uh, I decided I wanted to really hear folks' stories. I wanted to understand their journey from seed to pigment with whatever kind of indigo plant they happen to be growing. So this seasonal interview series started very organically 
and grew to 27 artists, growers, and farmers uh, sharing their journey every Monday live in the Indigo Pigment Extraction Methods group. I got a, a chance to interview them and hear more about their processes. And I'm excited to do it again this year. So this is going to be a seasonal reoccurring interview series. I invite you to join us and listen in. People can ask questions live. It's always a wonderful time. These are just a few of the people that I got to interview. Uh, I was the first guinea pig and Iris Sullivan Dare interviewed me. And then I got a chance to speak with folks from all over the US, outside of the US, um, into the UK, Australia, Brazil, India. I got to speak with Rosa Chang. And including Mexico. And I learned so much from this series. Uh, not only did I make quite a few friends through this process, um, but I got to interview folks through translators and speak to people that normally I wouldn't have an intimate connection with uh, just through our language differences. I, I speak language, um, English exclusively, and so it was really fortunate um, to be able to have translators to speak through and with. And uh, that process in the, of Blue Biographies has really impacted me greatly, uh, so much so that I am at the point where I think uh, that sharing story and sharing intimate connection over indigo is maybe one of the most important pieces of art that I will create. <laughs> and when I say create, I mean co-create and collaborate on. It might be even more important than any piece of cloth that I dye at this point. Um, so I'm really interested in um, those communal connections. I'm really interested in hearing the stories and in sharing those stories with other folks. So the next uh, little snippet I want to show you is a couple of the other opportunities that indigo bearing, bearing plants can give you. Uh, I was fortunate to go on a little trip with a group and harvest wild woad in the Siskiyou National Forest. And here it is. Uh, and I'm showing you this purple silk because this is the isomer rub Indy Rubin that's also readily available in indigo bearing plants. So particularly in woad, which is Estasis tinctoria. And uh, this plant actually gave me purple before it gave me blue. It was quite a surprise, <laughs> but it was a pleasant surprise. And this is also Indy Rubin, but this is from my plants that I grow. This is Persicaria tinctoria Indy Rubin. So on the left, you'll see this bright green endoxyl rich liquid um, that can convert to this incredible purple. And I'm very appreciative to learn this technique, um, a really simplified version of this technique through one of the interviewees from the Blue Biography series. So uh, just all these connections have been made through interacting with this generous group of people who are sharing their stories. Um, again, I mentioned the wild woad. We had a little warriors expedition with Scott, Chloe, and Erin. And these are the pigments that we collected. These are all from second and first year wild woad plants here in Oregon. A couple of the other applications that I love to use are pigment sticks, particularly pastels. And indigo really offers a range, which is quite lovely to work with all the different blues. 
Uh, another infamous blue that I've learned a little bit more about, um, often called Mayan blue. Uh, I was able to learn from another blue biographies interviewee named Raoul Plantong, and he was able to educate me on the Mayan blue techniques of combining indigo pigment, which would have traditionally traditionally been the anil indigo barus of Fruticosa plant. Uh, with sepia-like clays and other binders. Um, this is a technique that's known here in the States um, often as Mayan blue, although it doesn't reflect the traditional techniques that the Mayan and indigenous peoples would have used. So this is very much inspired by Mayan blue, um, but it is not traditional Mayan blue pigment. We call this coastal valley blue. This is uh, three different indigos combined with sepulite clay, another collaboration with Fiber Valley Farm and Dreambird Studio. So we have the raw indigo pigment, the raw sepulite clay, uh, which creates this beautiful light blue pigment often used for paint making, um, pastel making, soap making. It's a very light, fast, and stable blue pigment. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about just my own journey to Indigo. Um, I have grown up in Oregon. I'm really grateful and privileged to be able to, uh, to be surrounded by nature, surrounded by oceans, mountains, <laughs> lakes, rivers, I was homeschooled all through my uh, kindergarten to high school years. I grew up in a family that loved plants, um, a family that loved being outside, and I was able to spend um, a lot of my childhood out in the backyard, in the forest, learning plant names, uh, learning about my natural surroundings. Uh, so I've always had an affinity uh, in talking to plants and being with plants. And um, so I'm, I'm really fortunate uh, to have be, been able to find Kara of Vibrant Valley Farm growing this indigo plant not far from me. She really encouraged me to utilize the plant. Um, and then later on meeting Ginger here at the coast and Ginger is the owner of North Fork 53 Farm. Ginger is the person who really nurtured me, who really held my hand, uh, taught me about soil, taught me about seed starting, and uh, helped me with a place to grow my indigo. Uh, another person that's really nurtured me here, again, is Iris, uh, Dreambird Studio, and she was the one who came alongside with community collaboration. Uh, really taught me to look around at the surroundings. Um, what do we have for resources here? How can we create and nurture with local color here in this community? So I have been really blessed to have been doula by so many women um, who've encouraged me in my practice. Um, there's so many people, I couldn't name them all. Everyone in the Indigo Pigment Extraction Methods group has influenced me. Um, and this, in turn, has brought me to a place where I love to do well for others. So I love to bring um, support and a nurturing space for people to enter into their own Indigo practice whether that's through growing the plant or using the pigment as a dye um, or sharing story. A lot of my influence uh, with indigo is also influenced by my study of music. I've been a musician um, since I was 11 years old. I've been teaching piano lessons uh, for half of my life and so music and metaphor and analogy are always finding their way into my indigo practice, often in the form of poetry. Um, 
and this poem is featured in the gallery exhibit. This is just a little snippet of the Just Being poem, which is really um, a metaphor for the, the natural life, death, life cycles, um, and the beauty of transition from one phase to the next. So that's all for my presentation. I just wanted to thank everyone involved in the project. I wanted to thank Rosa and the Baltimore Dye Initiative and Micah for hosting and for creating this safe space to share. Um, I think it's really beautiful that the title of this exhibit is uh, Jong Chi, the nest, and it, which is the Korean word for nest. Um, and I really feel held by this experience and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For you. Um, and uh, we will, I already uh, collect a bunch of questions while you're uh, presenting your um, story. So I, we hope to hear more from you during the live Q&A session on April 30th. Wonderful, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.